Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kirill Semenovsky, and I've been involved in the movement for 15 years in different uh, capacities and roles. Uh, today, I'm going to present a research on uh, the content of the Wikimedia projects as uh, a free knowledge. Uh, as an economist, I've been always wondering, uh, uh, is there any economic justification or explanation of the work I'm doing on the Wikimedia projects? Because there have been always people saying, oh, you're wasting your time, you're doing something that uh, you don't uh, earn anything for, why are you doing so? And uh, I thought it was always like, I'm not alone. There are a lot of people doing the same thing and uh, deriving some uh, utility from it. So I tended to explain whether this is uh, true, is there any economic justification, and is the work that I'm producing actually uh, really freely accessible to anyone in the world? So. Uh, free knowledge is commonly thought as, but in practice it's not a pure public good. And uh, while it's uh, perfectly non rivalrous meaning that if I know something, I don't prevent anyone else to uh, have the same knowledge. For example, if I know that Singapore is an island country in Southeast Asia, that knowledge doesn't prevent anyone else uh, to acquire the same knowledge. But the problem comes with the uh, excludability, and this is what makes... Uh, free knowledge, uh, not a pure public good. Uh, this is mostly driven by uh, different factors, which uh, are related to the limitation of access and is driven by economic, institutional and uh, uh, social factors. So uh, the result is that less people can consume the free knowledge and also at the sa same time less people can produce. And uh, in economics, uh, that creates economic inefficiency. So uh, the main research questions uh, here are uh, why is the free knowledge not a pure public good? Then, what are the implications of the impurity? How this uh, impurity can be measured? And what are the implications of uh, it? Uh, how, big are the, uh, how big are the implications across countries? And what are the driving factors that lead to this impurity? So, uh, at the beginning, I'm going to define uh, what's the difference between uh, a pure and an impure public good. Then I'm going to use this knowledge to uh, develop a model on uh, free knowledge. Uh, I also introduced the concept of an invisible text as a measure of excludability. And at the end, I'm uh, calibrating the model with uh, data from the Wikimedia projects in order to study how big are the impurities or how big is the invisible text across countries. So why is this so important? Uh, it's uh, actually included in the Wikimedia vision. Imagine a world in which every single person on the planet is given free access to the, su the sum of all human knowledge. The line, every single person on the planet is given free access, actually refers to non-excludability. So the ultimate goal of the Wikimedia movement is to make the content on the Wikimedia projects a pure public good. So publicly accessible to anyone. Okay. Uh, the economic literature on this topic especially on free knowledge is uh, pretty scarce, but uh, there are many papers uh, on the contribution to public goods. I'm not going to delve too much on this, and I'll just explain that uh, uh, a must read uh, is the warm glow theory by Andreoni, developed uh, by the end of the 80s and in the early 90s. Uh, he opines that uh, people are impure altruists and uh, they're not driven by their desire to contribute, but also because of the, the joy that they have while contributing to the public goods. I also strongly recommend the fairness and reciprocity models uh, by Rabin and Fair. Uh, these are very interesting because if a person wants to contribute to a public good, then that person also expects to get something from the other side. That's called reciprocity and it's very interesting. And in recent times, there are also many models and uh, theories developed around the social image and the pro-social behavior. Uh, understanding the social motives that drive people to contribute to public goods. With regards to the Wikimedia projects, uh, I have seen uh, only a couple of uh, papers. Uh, the one by Jag and Ju is uh, published in a reputable uh, peer-reviewed uh, journal in economics. It uh, consists of a natural experiment on the Chinese Wikipedia after it was blocked in order to uh, study uh, how the behavior of the editors changed as a result of the block. Uh, this paper uh, by Algan and the group of authors was presented at Wikimania 20, uh, 2014 in London. 
It also consists of an experiment, but it's an online experiment about the public goods game in producing uh, the Wikimedia content. So, uh, I begin with explaining what is a pure and what an impure public good. Uh, I assume that there is a, a good G in the economy with two properties. The first one is, is excludability and the second one rivalry. So these are the main properties of the public goods. Uh, I scale them uh, on an interval between zero and one where one denotes perfect non-excludability and perfect non-rivalry. I also assume that uh, almost every good in the economy has a complementary good C so that its scalability is uh, not only a function of its price, but also of uh, the access to its complementary good. For example, if I have uh, an online uh, newspaper subscri subscription, but I don't have uh, a computer, then uh, the subscri subs subscription is worthless. Even though I don't need to pay the price, I cannot access the newspaper because I don't have a computer to do it. So, I assume that uh, every complementary good uh, has uh, a price which is the lowest price that some individuals cannot afford to pay. So every price below this price means that the good is uh, non-excludable because every person in the uh, economy, in the world, can pay that price and can access the good. So, uh, technically the excludability is a function of this price. It is the highest level of excludability at which there are individuals who cannot access the good. So this is the uh, eta uh, headed above, eta overlined. In the same way, I can also define uh, the uh, break-even point of rivalry. This is the rho overlined, which is the highest level of rivalry at which there are individuals who cannot uh, consume the good. And uh, here is a very nice definition about what is a pure and what an impure uh, good. Technically, a pure good is uh, one which has uh, uh, rival, uh, which is perfectly non-rivalous and perfectly non-excludable. It has the values of one. An impure public good is one which uh, is not perfectly non-rivalous or perfectly non-excludable, but it, it still has values above these uh, threshold values. While a private good is one which is uh, either excludable or rivalry, rivalous. Uh, and uh, it has at least one of these values, which is lower than uh, uh, the uh, threshold values. So on this chart, uh, the green area on the top right corner actually uh, represents the public good area. So if the values, if the combination of values of rivalry and uh, excludability is located there, puts the good there, then the good is a public good. If it's not, then it's a private good. So uh, why is this important in the context of the good G? Because a public good G is pure if it's perfectly non-rivalous, its price is equal to zero, and if the complementary good is a public good. And it's, in, it's an impure public good if it's perfectly non-rivalous, it's uh, free of charge, its price equals to zero, and the complementary good is a private good. By applying mathematical induction, this can be easily extended to the case of an infinitely many uh, complementary goods. So, uh, a public good needs to be pure, uh, can be pure if and only if for each sequence of complementary goods, all of them are public goods. If at least one of them is a private good, then the public good G is an impure public good. And here is a very nice implication of this, that, that individuals who cannot afford to pay one in, for one in the network of the complementary goods, they can also not access the public good, the primary public good. So, uh, to illustrate this better, uh, for example, let's take the Wikimedia content uh, and assume that it has uh, three uh, complementary goods. The first one is the internet access, the second one uh, uh, are the IT skills that uh, the people need to possess in order to access the Wikimedia content, and also the literacy, which is also important to read the content on the projects. And if uh, at least one of these complementary goods fails to be a public good, then uh, the content of the Wikimedia projects will not be uh, a uh, pure public good. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the development of the model. Uh, I assume that uh, the economic environment consists of a finite number of individuals and uh, they operate uh, in a discrete and infinite time. Uh, but uh, the production of uh, free knowledge uh, takes place in a continuous time setting. 
Uh, I also assume that every person uh, has a leisure time age, which they decide to divide on uh, consuming free knowledge and also contributing to the production of free knowledge. I uh, denote them by V and uh, W. And uh, W, which is the contribution time of producing to the free knowledge, is also dependent on uh, uh, the altruism level, on the uh, size of the population, the number of people contributing to the free knowledge, and also on the development of the region that uh, the person comes from. I think uh, here it's very important to explain the altruism level, which uh, can take uh, values uh, equal to zero, uh, which denotes the case of uh, an egoist, and a uh, value greater than zero, which denotes the, person, uh, the, the state of uh, an altruist. In case uh, this z is uh, equal to zero, it means that uh, uh, the time that uh, the person uh, spends to contribute to, to contribute to the free knowledge equals to zero. And uh, this definition uh, helps to divide the population into, into two groups. The first one consists of people uh, contributing and producing uh, the free knowledge. And the second one is uh, the group of free riders, only the people who consume the free knowledge but not contribute to its production. So, uh, each uh, person contributing to uh, the production of free knowledge uh, has an individual share, which is denoted by J, and it's a function uh, by G. It's a function by the time that the person spends and the productivity rate to producing the knowledge. And uh, then, by this function, uh, can the total amount of free knowledge can produced in the economy can be easily expressed. It's very important that uh, all these. Uh, uh, components of uh, the function of free knowledge are independent so that it can be decomposed in three parts. The first one is uh, the individual production by each individual in the economy. Then we have the contribution by all other people. And we also have uh, the state or the amount of free knowledge produced uh, in all previous periods. Then uh, another very important thing uh, in the model are the social interactions. Uh, this is very important because uh, the Wikimedia movement is uh, a social environment. We have people communicating with each other in order to produce the knowledge. And I also assume that uh, every people derives additional utility. There is a function of additional utility from social interactions with other people in the economy, with other individuals contributing to the production of free knowledge. The idea here is that uh, the people expect that by those social interactions, the productivity rate will increase and they will uh, make more quality edits or their contribution to the free knowledge will be of higher quality. Uh, this, of course, uh, alters the uh, production function. So the total amount of free knowledge produced also includes the effect of the social interactions in the economy. To better illustrate this, uh, I present it uh, with a simple graph of four vertices and uh, six directed edges in which every person uh, interacts with uh, every other person in the economy. And uh, from those social interactions, they derived additional utility, which contributes to increasing the, has to contribute to increase the quality of their uh, edits. And uh, at the end, I think it's very important to uh, explain the utility function. So every agent, every individual in the economy has uh, a utility problem that uh, they aim to maximize. It consists of uh, two utility functions. The first one is the utility of consumption. So it's uh, an increasing uh, function of uh, the time that people spend to consume free knowledge, to read and to learn from the knowledge on the Wikimedia project. And it's also an increasing function of the amount of uh, knowledge available. So, if there are more articles on Wikipedia, then people would get uh, higher utility because they can read uh, more content. And the second uh, component is the social benefit of production. This is uh, exactly what drives people to contribute to the Wikimedia projects. Because if this is equal to zero, then people would uh, spend uh, their entire time to consume the Wikimedia content. But it's impossible because if no one produces the content, then there will be no knowledge available, no free knowledge available. And then the whole value of the maximization problem would be zero. So the social benefit, uh, the social benefit function is an increasing function of uh, uh, the time spent to uh, produce uh, free knowledge. And it's also a decreasing function of the amount of free knowledge available. 
the assumption here is that uh, if there are more articles, if there is more content, people would be not uh, uh, that motivated to contribute and they would uh, uh, prefer to spend uh, less time to contribute to the production of free knowledge. And here is an important proposition. Uh, that's the Nash equilibrium in the production of free knowledge, which is achieved when uh, the time spent to contribute and uh, the free knowledge available equals to zero can be achieved if and only if the social benefit, fu benefit function is equal to zero. So uh, the, int the intuition is very simple. If people don't uh, uh, derive utility from their contributions to the free knowledge, then they would uh, prefer not to spend time because it's useless and they would uh, rather spend more time to consume the knowledge and derive utility from it. Okay, so uh, the equilibrium in the economy, so I assume this is a, a market economy. Uh, there is a market of free knowledge in the sense of uh, any other good. So the equilibrium is achieved when uh, the aggregate uh, supply meets the aggregate demand. And it's very important that at this equilibrium, at this steady state, uh, individuals tend to make decisions on how much time to spend to contribute to free knowledge and how much interactions to have with the individuals in order to achieve that level. So, uh, after explaining, after defining the equilibrium uh, in the economy, I move on to uh, explain what's the effect of excludability and rivalry. So here I define uh, a rate of excludability in the economy, which affects the number of people that uh, can uh, have access to the free knowledge. So uh, the total number of individuals can be decomposed in two parts. The first one is uh, uh, the share of people who have access to the free knowledge. And the second one is the one of people who are excluded from uh, consuming the free knowledge. The excludability rate uh, does not only depend on uh, the prices of, uh, uh, the vector of prices of uh, the complementary goods, but it also is dependent on uh, the uh, rivalry levels to access the good and also on the policies by the government. For example, if there is a censorship in a country, even though the people can uh, access free knowledge, if it's censored, they cannot do it. So this is also a major source of uh, excludability, which may result in less people having access to the knowledge. And at the end, uh, if I analyze the aggregate demand and aggregate supply, it can be noted that the demand curve is below the demand curve in the case of uh, perfect uh, uh, non-excludability. And also the aggregate supply is lower because uh, the supplied knowledge in the economy, the, amount of, the to total amount of supplied knowledge in the economy is less than the total supplied uh, knowledge that it would be in the case of uh, uh, perfect non-excludability. So uh, here comes the main part regarding the concept of the indivisible tax of uh, free knowledge. It actually is uh, the reflection of lower supply of free knowledge as a result of the excludability and rivalry in the economy. And it can be calculated as uh, the uh, uh, total amount of free knowledge that is not produced in the economy because some people cannot access free knowledge and the total amount that uh, could have been produced uh, had all people had access to free knowledge. And uh, the important question is why to call it an invisible tax? First of all, in public economics, a tax is known as an amount levied by the government, by the authorities, to support production and provision of public goods. But the thing is that in microeconomics, a tax is something else. It's uh, a source of economic inefficiency, which results uh, in lower supply and demand, and it actually leads to the creation of a deadweight loss. And it is called invisible because there are no monetary payments. So it's not that someone uh, uh, gets money from the people in the economy, but even in that case, the effects in the economy are the same as uh, in the presence of the taxes. So on this chart, uh, there is a nice depiction of uh, how this affects uh, the market equilibrium. As you can note, the red uh, shaded area here 
represents the debt loss, debt weight loss. It's uh, the area which is created like an economic inefficiency because of the lower demand and the lower supply, leading to uh, a lower steady state in the economy, lower equilibrium. And uh, there is some major theorem at the end, which represents what the debt, loss, debt weight loss means in practical terms. So the debt weight loss of uh, taxing the free knowledge is the sum of utility functions of all individuals that have no access to free knowledge. In fact, it represents those people who do not have free access in the economy. This is very intuitional because if I don't have access to free knowledge, I cannot enjoy the benefits of, of that uh, knowledge which is available online. And uh, at the end, I move on to calibrate the model. I use data from the Wikimedia project, but I have to know that uh, there are missing data on uh, page edits for many countries, like for example, Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, and Thailand. And the pa page edits uh, are very important because uh, they're the main uh, supply metrics, the main metrics used to uh, calibrate the, the, the supply of free knowledge. Whereas on the demand side, I use uh, the page views uh, as a metric. Uh, then I move on to uh, calculate the annual elasticities of uh, page edits, which are estimated uh, by using this quadratic uh, regression. I regress the page edits per capita uh, by using the share of internet users and the literacy rate, which is the quadratic term. And I also aggregate the page edits per country using the formula of the average uh, page edits and the average number of editors. Uh, because uh, the Wikimedia Foundation uh, is still working on uh, the development of uh, concise and precise uh, data sets of uh, uh, page edits per country, I used the statistics of uh, uh, bucketed page edits per countries and decided to uh, use the average of uh, their uh, buckets of their intervals and also to normalize them in order to, in order to calculate the average uh, number of page edits. Uh, this table shows the results of the calibration of the elasticities that are used to uh, calculate the potential maximum of edits made and uh, Wikipedia articles created. This is very important because the potential maximum represents the amount of free knowledge that would be produced if there is no excludability in the economy. And here are the results of uh, the calibration. These are results uh, across countries. I'm really not uh, that, uh, uh, this is uh, really not uh, something strange to me. I expected to have these results, but the magnitude of the differences, the drastic magnitude across countries is really uh, pretty strange. I didn't expect to have such results. For example, the lowest rates are uh, uh, can be observed uh, mostly in the developed countries, especially in Europe, in uh, North America, in the US and Canada, as well as in Australia, New Zealand and uh, Japan. Uh, the point is that the lowest rates uh, uh, have been observed in Luxembourg, 0.3%. This means that uh, given the current state in this uh, country, 99.7% 99 of the total uh, available uh, free knowledge could be produced in the economy, which means that only 0.3% represents the loss of the knowledge that is produced because of the non excludability uh, Similar uh, rates, uh, uh, invisible tax rates have been uh, uh, obtained for Norway and Finland. Whereas on the other hand, uh, the highest uh, tax rates, the invisible tax rates uh, have been observed for Malawi, Chad and Lesotho, African countries, in which uh, almost 99.8% of the total free knowledge in the economy, which could be produced, is not produced because of the excludability. And I also made a comparison between the Global South and Global North. Uh, the invisible tax rate uh, in the countries of Global South uh, is 77.2%, uh, which means that only 20, 20.8% of the uh, potential maximum of free knowledge is produced there. Whereas in the Global North, it's uh, only 14.6%, which means that uh, more than 80, 5% of the potential maximum is produced. And uh, with regards to the factors of excludability, uh, I analyzed three of them. The first one is digital divide. 
in 2022, the average share of internet users was uh, uh, slightly above 50% in global south, whereas in the global north, it was uh, almost 90%, which uh, speaks about a large and uh, drastic difference. Then another uh, source of excludability is the net neutrality versus zero rating uh, paradigm. Uh, for example, uh, there are a lot of authors uh, arguing that uh, zero rating uh, has positive economic effects for consumers, which means that more consumers could uh, consume the free knowledge. And uh, there was a very nice uh, project by the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, Wikipedia Zero, which was an attempt to reduce excludability across countries. And the main criticism of this project was that it was not uh, uh, net neutral. It was against the principle of net neutrality. And at the end, we have the censorship. Uh, this is uh, a case in which governments uh, deliberately uh, seize uh, access to the Wikimedia projects so that uh, people are prevented to access the free knowledge. This can be done, done by uh, blocking content and by prosecuting editors. And uh, there have also been uh, some uh, examples of uh, some traces of censorship in uh, developed countries, in uh, democratic countries like the UK, Australia, France, and Germany, where there were uh, disputes related to single articles. And uh, about the future research, uh, I think uh, this is uh, an ongoing uh, project. Uh, this is something that uh, could be uh, improved in the future. So uh, it's good to obtain uh, new and uh, more detailed granular data on the Wikimedia project so that the model can be recalibrated. Uh, then there is also room to uh, work on uh, the model's components, like, for example, to model the marginal utility functions, to estimate and forecast the contribution uh, times spent by editors, and also to study the social interactions between uh, people. And uh, there is also a lot of room to conduct experiments, like, for example, natural experiments to study the effect of uh, reforms and censorship, and also to conduct an, uh, online experiments in order to uh, study the behavior and preferences of uh, the Wikipedia editors. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. Okay.